uh, for others that were not able to come and for one reason or another have to fellowship and uh, enjoy the service from the comfort of their homes and wherever else they are welcome also and we are grateful that you are able to follow us on YouTube and on our Facebook. I would like us to pray and just ask the Lord to speak to us. Can you kindly open your mouth and ask God, God speak to us. Speak to me also. Speak to the family. Speak to our nation. Speak to the church. Sit and wordly. Speak to the sit and family. Speak. Lord, speak in our generation. Grant that we would hear your voice and that we would be comforted that you're with us. Yes, Lord, hear the cry of your children. Speak to us, we pray. Speak to me, Daddy, I ask, and speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope in the twists and turns of life. It is one weekday, and I'm coming from the Bible study, driving a wet, on a wet road, very dark night, cloudy, very dark, can hardly see, even with the lights on, can hardly see a few meters ahead. And all of a sudden, I realize that I am uh, at a place that is so steep, the car is skidding, and before me, there is a sharp corner, just after that corner, there is a culvert and a deep gully, and the water is running almost full there, and after that culvert, after that sharp turn, there is a river. And without even having thought through the uh, unfolding realities, as I drive alone on that uh, dark night, I am hanging over the culvert, and I have not much option because underneath me is a, a, a gully full of water, the trench, the culvert, full of water. And after the car has skidded, I realize that I can't even get myself out of the car. It is dark, I'm alone. It's one of the nights that I am not touch as a driver. And I'm there and I'm wondering, so what is this? And uh, by God's mercy, I come out, and no phones then. I didn't have a mobile phone, so I have to walk up the winding road to our residence, where I thought then alone, not even knowing what it is that would be ahead of us. And you know, in life, sometimes you fight your... Your life, your situation turns south. What do you do when you come to that place? You don't have many options. And you are right with the twists and the turns of life. Complications dealing with circumstances. You don't know what to choose. Surprising changes is what Merriam Webster dictionary calls the twists and turns of life. And they are curves and frequent changes of direction. You are not even ready. You have not even chosen your action. Dealing with the unexpected and you are face to face with the ups and downs of life. And sometimes you don't know what you think, what you feel, least about the choice that you'd take. And in this service, or as you follow us, those who are following us online, I don't know what your thoughts are, what thoughts are going through your mind, and what emotions you are experiencing right now, and the consequent behavior. Are you here and you're frowning, and you're saying, Pastor, who told you where I am? Or you're smiling and say, well, things are going on for me. In Psalm 57, verse 1 to 11, and I would like to uh, ask us to turn to our Bibles uh, so that we read and hear a man of God. In fact, the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. Finds himself 
in circumstances that would fit the description of the twists and the turns of life. Psalm 57, the Bible says from verse 1, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge in the shadow of the wings, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to you, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He was sent from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who trembles on me. God was sent out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp sons. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dig a pit in my way, but they have fallen in it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. I awake my glory. Awake. O oh, harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Where do we get hope in the twists and the turns of life? Verse 1 and 2 will see that prayer is a God, is a source that God has given to his people. And that from God alone we can receive mercy and grace from him alone is help and safety for our lives. As we will see from the man of God, the man after God's uh, heart, David, from a Psalm, uh, rather 1 Samuel 22, actually from first 1 to rather 21, 1 Samuel 21 to 28. And in verse 3 to 6 and verse 11, David takes a pause, which is another source of our hope, a time to look in order to understand, in order to see and really know what context that you are in and what is the nature of your experience. And for 7 to 10, we would see that another source is the praise to God. We know in the Bible times that God would direct his servant, the king, Ezekiah, to place a worship team ahead of an army. And he tells them, to praise and to worship God. Where on earth did you hear? People have guns. Others have other missiles. And a person goes out worshiping and praising and wins the battle. It is only in God. It is only in praising God, not another man, not another person, not any other thing. The creator who is our sovereign God that we have. Praise bringing change to our twists and the turns we find ourselves in in life in first one david says have mercy on me have mercy on me oh god as, as though god was not hearing when he calls for the first time he says lord be gracious to me it is like asking god can you hear the king is asking your servant the man after your own heart is saying be merciful to me help me this brings to us the intensity the urgency 
of the situation that David was in, the desperation when David realizes that although the king Saul was meant to be protecting him, instead he follows him seeking to shoot him as it were not to shoot but to spear him. You will remember that three times Saul sought to actually pin David on the wall and by the mercies of God, David escaped. And so, not deserving to be killed, but yet his life is sought after, needing protection from the one who should be told. Isn't that the cry we hear today? Oh, government, protect us. Needing security. And he says, actually, in verse 1, he says that, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. When a storm comes, you are not ready for it. David does not only ask for mercy, but David also finds himself needing help. And so he says, I cry out to you, God. Would you imagine the king to be? We have been for a while talking about the incoming bishop. We thank God that now we have the bishop, Callisto Odede. And so we would be saying, oh, the bishop is crying for help. King David says, I cry out to God. He realizes that help was not in him, although he had been anointed, and oil flew. I mean, oil was flowing upon him. Oil anointing was speaking, and the seat was ready for him, but he will not be given chance. And he also realizes that help was not even in the king. It was not in the hand the leader of the people, Saul, the man that God had chosen, and who was a, a, a height above others in the land when he came to the office. You will realize that when Saul came into this cave, uh, cave where David and his men, some a commentary say about 400 people were with Paul. Others say about 600 men were with him. And they were crying out and saying, come on, David, can't you see? When Saul came in, God has given the enemy to your hands. But imagine, Saul comes and David has time to crawl. I don't know from what corner. He was hiding, and he sees Saul has gone into the case to do one of those natural things that people do, help themselves in one way or another. And the king is there, and David tiptoes and has time to cut off the piece of his robe. Maybe his trail may have been long. And we are told that in those days, the kings were clad in flowing robes. But it doesn't matter. Oh, didn't you see the insecurity even of the king? That a subject he is chasing is now the one who has time to cut off a part of his garment. And so David declares, even the king cannot help me if he, he can come. And other than being at, I mean, other than my being at his mercy, he is now at my mercy. He is not the one who would help me. And so, though David feels challenged and he feels defeated and he is crying, I mean crying out to, uh, uh, and to God and asking for mercy, he also realizes that prayer is about taking refuge under the wings of the Lord until your disaster has taken off, until the storm has passed. And the picture that we clearly see here is the picture of a hen. Some of us rear chicken. And when chicken, when a mother hen has chicks and there is danger uh, looming, you realize that when hawks come around looking for the chicks because they are 
eyes are very sharp. What will happen? The chicks, the mother hen realizes, it knows that it is time to cover and to protect the chicks. And the chicks don't need to be told by anybody. It is time to run for refuge under our mother. And if the hawk has to get any of the chicks, if anyone would get any one of the chicks, it has to go through the mother hen. Friends, God does not need to be told there is danger because he knows it. God does not need to be told I am in a corner because he is all knowing. We go for mercy from God because mercy takes away the punishment or the treatment that our circumstances present us with. We go for grace from God because it gives us the unmerited favor, the help, the, com the, 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 the security, the help that we do not deserve. Needing care, protection, love, and love in the crisis. In twists and turns of life, we need to depend on God's grace and mercy. Why we are not perfect and none of us is. Only God is able. We cannot rely on human beings. Indeed, we realize even human beings are limited. Are you here? And it is you that David is describing. When he says, have mercy on me, Lord. When he says, I cry out. Here the king can cry. It is okay for you to also cry. Because God hears and answers our cry. We can take a refuge in him because he is the refuge. He is the hiding place. He is our, a place of safety. So the one source of hope in our challenges, in our twists and the turns, in our grief, in our loss, in our disappointment, is that God has given us the place of prayer. And the second would be what I call the pause. Prayer, but yes, a time of investigating. What is happening? Where am I? What is actually happening? How dark is it? How deep? Am I from where I am? I feel I am falling. How long will I be jobless? What is the scenario in the nation? What is happening across the globe? The post David talks about in verse 3, he says, He was sent from heaven and saved me. I will put to shame, sorry, he will put to shame him who trembles. On me. So one thing David realizes is being as it were troubled upon. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. David realizes that he needed salvation. He needed assurance in his cave. Darkness engulfed him. But he needed love. He needed to know that his life mattered. He needed faithful friends. And his friends are telling him, come on, arise and kill. This is your enemy. He feels he needed faithful friends. He realizes that he needed the help that God would send. And that is why he cries to him. And that God is able to handle his enemies. Indeed, in verse 4, David, in his post, realizes that his circumstances were not easy. Interesting. He says, my soul is in the midst of lions. Wow. In other words, his thoughts, his feelings, his, his, his emotions, all what he felt and thought he felt is like being mild. He, was, he had no life left in him. And he says, I lie down amid fiery beasts. Not beasts as it were, but... The children of men. <laughs> At another, another time he says, if it was somebody else, I would have understood. But a man that I went with to the house of God. 
One that I expected to protect me. Salt, the one for whom I play the harp. When the evil spirits have come upon, it's the same man that follows me to kill me for no good reason. He is the king. I've not asked him to leave or vacate the seat. People that I'm with in the cave, in the darkness of this cave, are telling me, arise and commit sin. Arise and do what the Lord does not allow. And he says, children of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords, targeted, aimed at he feels he is the haunted. And in his taking the post, in verse 6, he realizes, yes, he is trapped. He is ensnared. And a deep pit has been dug for him. The enemy was living different life to no chances. He needed him destroyed. Not only targeting him as it was shooting at his thoughts, his feelings, his emotions were in turmoil and feeling insecure without help alone, though amongst others. Run after by the man that he should have been protecting. But verse 5 and 11, if we can read together, if you can help me read uh, from your Bible, wherever you're reading from. Can we read together? What does it say? Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Yes, David is actually in the cave, dark, haunted, sought after, without help. And in verse uh, uh, 4, he feels like his animals are tearing him apart. The ones that are spoken are like arrows and like sharp swords ready to tear him, to devour his flesh. But in that circumstance, he discovers, he realizes, he understands where God is in the picture. He understands, he remembers. Like Lamentations, chapter 3, would remind us that God is faithful. I call this to mind. That actually David says, I call this to mind, or he portrays that in his declaration. That God should be exalted. That in the nature and the character of God, it is clear that he is present with him right where he is. And that he is greater than the challenges, than the darkness in that cave. And that in the twists and in the turns of life, God is exalted and he is glorified. Jim Shoemaker, in trying to respond to uh, uh, Kubla Ross's cycle of loss and grief. He says that sometimes we can find ourselves in shock when we find ourselves in the twists and the turns of life, we are shocked and the initial paralysis at hearing the news or seeing where we are makes us shocked. He also says that we can be in denial trying to avoid the inevitable, thinking I can't go home, and yet you are, at, you are at the road. You are in a trench. I mean, you are in a cave. So is that home? No, 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 no. And that we can be angry, frustrated, outpouring our bottled up emotions to other people and looking for blame. Who caused this car to skid? It is God. Where were you, God? Why, God? And I realized that one of the questions that is so frequent on our lips as we go through the, uh, the twists and the turns of life is, God, why? I mean, I give my tithe. I mean, I give my offering. I'm faithful. 
to pray on Wednesdays. I got for prayer. I mean, I don't miss services, God. I pray even for the pastors. I do. I am the focus. I am the perspective. But David tells us otherwise. And we realize that we can even be bargaining, yet going to depression. You know, realizing that actually even as we bargain and look for what we could have done, what we have done and things are not working, hey, we are disappointed because this is where we are anyway. And life could be, as it were, putting us into a place of testing, seeking realistic solutions that are not available actually, and acceptance finally where we uh, fight the way out. And this is where we would begin healing. And another uh, 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 psychologist says that when we get to this uh, 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 time of realizing, well, we are post and we realize this is the scenario. Uh, I need to repeat a year in my academic work so that I can and fan so on, I can proceed. Then we begin healing. When we realize that now, you know, my beloved has gone. My dad is no more, or my spouse, or my child is gone, has died. And so she or he will not sit where they did at home. Then we start realizing, wow. Therefore, I have to start learning that the bumps he used to fix in the house I have to learn to do that. I have to get stools to step on and start working. All that I have to have an extra job, another source of income. That besides being salaried, well, I may need to rear chicken. I don't know why I'm talking about chicken today. <laughs> Posing gets us the right perspective. And David says, uh, that his heart was fixed. Indeed, in uh, uh, the verses we read, he says that his heart, let me look for it, he says that my heart is fixed. And he says several things. As he says that God will send out his love and his faithfulness to me and that he will actually send from heaven and save me and he will deal with my enemies. David says from verse 7, I will sing and make melody. He also says, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks. He also says, I will praise. I will sing praises to the Lord God among the nations. Where is your heart? Do you understand that God is sovereign? Do you understand that God is in control? That we are not involving God when things have happened and we are saying, oh God, come and see. God is of a role. And we will see as we look at the final P, the P of pray, our praise to God, that he is the creator. He controls. He is in charge. And Francis J. Crosby, commonly known as Fanny, who lived in 1820 to 1915, was a lady, a girl that was born and after six months, or was it six weeks actually? She went blind because of a sickness and treatment with wrong medicine. Did a baby deserve to be given wrong medicine? Uh -huh. Isn't there a way I would ask why? But she was blind, a blind, and she is one of the uh, people that have sung so and reaching hymns and has been referred to as the mother of the modern hymns sung in the church. And Crosby reminds us, or the life of Crosby reminds us that 
posing but a song in our circumstances from our heart irrespective of Crosby has sung such songs as do not pass me not O gracious savior Mm -hmm. And many others that we sing happily in the church and we sing people who sang them were people that were special, who lived in the presence of God. But she has also sung this hymn, a wonderful savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. I mean, she says in her blindness, she has pleasure like a river flowing. Posing gives us a new song. And she says that God, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shandos a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And he covers me there with his hand. Hallelujah. The Lord covers our lives. Even in the turns and the twists where your life has been fixed. One of the realities that many people struggle with today is joblessness. Corona has come and turned the globe upside down. So that even those who would be working, there is no donor fund to pay them in the places where they worked. People lost businesses and to date people are struggling to pick up their livelihood because where do their people get money? People that would eat meat uh, three or five kilos a week, today they eat a tray of eggs. A tree of eggs is how much? 350, at the most 400. A kilo of meat is 451 times three. So businesses do it do it. But friends, what God is reminding us is that we can have hope. As we pray, we can hear God in the darkness of our caves. For David, it was a cave. I don't know what it is that has turned and twisted your life in a very unpleasant manner. And that also if we take time to stop, like the ten spies were complaining because they were looking at life from their perspective. The two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, yes, the war, the city is warred. And they are strong men there, they are giants. The sons of Anak live there, but... God is well able to give us the land. They post, they thought about the promises, what they had they seen in Egypt, as God performed one plague after the other in devastation of the evil spirits that influenced Pharaoh's heart and others that would not let them leave slavery. But the ten spies would not see. What is our perspective? Where, when we get into the challenges, where we are, what is our post? I mean, in our post, what do we realize? Then, praise is yet another source of praise, rather a source of hope. Praise declares the worship of God. It is a deliberate focus on the right direction, on God alone. The creator, the ruler, and the, the sustainer of all creation. Nothing happens of which God does not, pour, uh, I mean, no. And Paul discovered that when he would cry to God in the story of the thorn, and God would tell him, my grace is sufficient for you. I mean, God, I'm feeling pain. Yes. But realizing that God knows and is able. He has allowed it. Do you have a thorn in the flesh that you wish would have been plucked five years ago or ten or even longer? The Lord knows it. We can still praise him amidst the pain. He says that in all these things give thanks to God. 
even in the cave moments, David says, I will praise the Lord. I will wait upon him. I will trust him. God allows it to happen. God allows our lives to be where we cannot do anything but look up to him so that he can bring his present result. Glory alone belongs to God. And he says, I share with no man my glory. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 13, you know the story of uh, Jacob's uh, sons and how they got one of them and they were jealous uh, of him and they threw him. And uh, the long story short, into prison, later on in Egypt, and he's the one who has to save their lives when there was famine across that world. And Joseph tells them, you intended it for evil, but God turned it for his good. My friend, not just for his good, but for your good. Even with bittersweet pains and problems, God is sovereign. And all of life is under God's control. Every road upon which an accident happens, the Lord knows it exists. Yes, we have human responsibility. But I tell you what, friends, God knows it. And so it is not by chance that things happen. It is not by fit. It is not even by luck. No, it is that God works and God is able to work. You know, we say by sheer luck I was included. I was enlisted for the interview. It is not sheer luck. Children of God from this day, from this 6th of December, please remember, our lives are not by fit. Our lives are not by luck. God owes, or rather owns, and rules of our lives. Hope through twists and lies. Can it be possible? Yes, because God is all we have in life. He was sent us his mercy. And in Matthew chapter 7, we see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ telling the people, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will receive. Fight, knock, and the door will be open for he who asks, receives. Those who seek, they find. And those that knock, the door is open for them. Trust God through life. Do say what God is to you. Do sing it. Do live it amidst pain, sorrow, grief, loss, hospitalization, job seeking, walking with others that you think don't deserve because they are weighed low down the kanda and you are high up in the lander. As you walk through every experience of life, dear children of God, David said, I will sing and I will declare it among the people. Actually, he says, I will say it among the nations. Will you sing of the faithfulness of God? Will you praise him in your office when you're told you are now not needed? <laughs> and in our downsizing, it is you we see ought to go. Hey, my God, hard. But recognize the context of life, the danger that you are in, so that you take the right action. Life situations are not forever. Do not revenge whatever happens to you. Let God turn it around for you are good. And he will take care of your real enemy. Because your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not your spouse. Your enemy is not your neighbor or your family member. Your enemy is not the leader. Your enemy is Satan. He is the one who hates God's children, and he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God comes. Jesus has come so that we may have life and have it in abundance. And then he says, uh, rather, the other thing is, have the right attitude, whether in pain or in joy. In other words, life should be not from our perspective. 
Life should be from the perspective of God. And so we can praise him. And our faith and relationship with God and other people won't be meaningful. So what were the implications uh, of David as he, he finds himself in such a situation as actually describes where we are, many of us today. One, the situation and the circumstances were hard, yes, he identified with others like Daniel who had known being in the den of lions. You remember, he identified, I think he could identify, or we can say he would identify with Jonah in the belly of a fish. Different circumstances, but all of them in the deep. But he looked out for God. He expressed out faith only in God. It turned out, rather, he turns from being trapped to having an upper hand of his enemy. So why? His direction was not like Saul's direction. It is this young man that will take my seat, I will eliminate him. No, he looks at it as God who made me for such a time as this. And so he has a plan, he has a way. He will fulfill it. He will bring it to be. And so David sings this psalm that is called, Do Not Destroy. He actually sings this a song. It is actually called the Mictum of David when he fled from Saul. And it is as though David was saying, Do not destroy my enemy. Do not destroy Saul. Do not destroy my enemy. The one who seeks after me. And at the same time, it is as though he was crying and saying, Lord, do not let my enemy destroy me. Have mercy on me. And can we cry out today and say, Lord, do not destroy. Do not destroy my son. Do not destroy my daughter. Do not destroy our church. Do not destroy our nation. Lord, do not let the enemy destroy us. He runs after us, but do not destroy my life. Lord, do not destroy. And for the enemy, we can look at him in the eye and tell him, you will not destroy me in the name of Jesus. Do not hurt. Do not destroy. The implications for us today is that even though things are hard and darkness looms like for David, yet we can seek God as our refuge and our source of help. Why? God is merciful. He is our help in the time of need. And in the, season, the seasons of life, we can fight life right where we fight ourselves because there is hope in him. Robin Mark sings and asks, will your anger hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold and the wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anger drift or will it remain firm? Brethren, we have an anger, he says, Robin Mark says, that keeps the soul stand fast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. And in conclusion, when life twists and turns your life, we realize there is hope. One, call out to God. Take a good pause. Embrace the hope that they are raised. Praise God of other situations. Pray to him. Stop and think. See the help. But give God the glory. Why? God knows your situation. God is able to deal with the enemy of your soul. And the fairy cave that you dwell in or you fight yourself in or you're running and you fight yourself in the darkness, the distress you fight yourself in. Right today as I speak right here, you're saying, who told you young lady? Or you may call me old lady, that that's where I am. That's life. The Lord is 
is able. And finally, as I will be calling our senior pastor kindly to come and bring this service to a close for us through a moment of prayer. Sons and daughters of the king, it is good to be reminded that our lives make sense even in the twists and turns of life when we are focused on God's kindness and on his truth. God is constant. He is faithful. He leans us. He guides us even when our life's journey takes us in directions we do not necessarily have warranted. Our lives have warranted. We haven't chosen. We haven't done anything to deserve to go that direction. Reminds me of a hugger, a maiden, a servant, a house manager in Abraham and Sarai's home. And since Sarai isn't able to conceive and give birth, she gives over the house help, as it were, to her husband. And later on, she tells the husband, chase this girl away. With a son, she finds herself in the twists and the turns of life. Circumstances can change, but God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and in 2021, he will be. He remains the same. Lamentations 3, 19 to 24. I would like us to read those ones because that is what the word of God says in Lamentations chapter 3. Let's just read that together. Verse 19 to 24. The word of God says, remember my affliction and my wanderings. My warm wood and the girl. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Dear children of God, there is no measure of help that will change us. It is in trusting him to save us. It is in trusting him to keep us. It is in trusting him as we go to him in prayer and as we pause to understand what exactly he's doing in our life to bring him glory and to make us better. Let us remember that our hope is in God and in our giving ourselves wholly to him. May your twists and the turns of your life bring you to where you can say, my heart is fixed in him. The Lord bless you. Amen.